everybody to the, the next in our series of um, seminars from the, the NERSC uh, 20 or 21 Early um, Career Achievement Award series. We, we started this series to, um, we started these series of awards to try to recognize some of the outstanding work that is done by young researchers using NERSC and, and give them an opportunity to share and to, and to recognize what they've done. Today we have Grant Johnson from Princeton University and, um, at, and Livermore National Lab. I believe he did his undergraduate work that um, was nominated while working um, in conjunction with Livermore as well. So welcome um, Grant and we have um, one thing to share with you which is a certificate um, recognizing your achievement for helping elucidate previously unexplained plasma surface interactions in tokamak fusion energy reactors so congratulations again and um, if you could just give me a, a mailing address we'll send you a, a physical um, copy of this and with that i'm going to stop sharing and um, turn it over to grant Right. Thank you very much, Richard. I cannot oh, let's try that one more time. Here we go. All right, can everyone see the screen? Excellent. Okay, so the inverted plasma sheath. Um, so my name is Grant Johnson. Um, I did this work while I was an undergraduate at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and um, I have now uh, moved to Princeton University as a graduate student in the plasma program. This was done in collaboration with Michael Campanell and Maxim Mumansky. So I'm going to give a brief overview very quickly uh, about what the talk's going to entail and then go through in a little bit more detail all these bullet points. So hopefully everyone has a pretty good idea of what the inverse sheath is by the end. Uh, so I'm going to talk with, uh, talk through the different electrostatic sheath regimes that you can get. Um, the, their initial discovery and the properties of the inverse sheath, uh, the computational model that we ended up using, and the simulations and results that we have. So to start with, um, electrostatic sheaths. So the classical light sheath uh, discovered by Langmuir is uh, uh, called in this um, paper, the classical, or in this talk, the classical sheath. So it's also been called other things such as a device sheath. Um, but what you end up having in this plot, we have the potential versus the distance from the surface normalized to the Debye length um, is the four different types of sheaths that you can possibly have. The first is the classical light sheath where you have no emission. Um, you have a boundary located at X equals zero and you have the plasma potential set um, at a far away distance, much farther than the range of this plot to be uh, phi, of zero, uh, phi of zero. What you then have is these three different types of sheaths that can form under different conditions. So marginal SCL, the SCL and the inverse. Um, the latter of these, uh, marginal SEL, SEL, and inverse, all require surface electron emission. Um, these, this can be achieved by uh, thermionic emission or for the SCL and marginal SCL, things like um, secondary electron emission. So what's the difference between these different things? Um, why are they all on the same plot? So the uh, marginal SCL case is right when the wall potential starts to change. You're no longer repelling electrons and keeping them to the bulk plasma and accelerating ions to the surface as strongly as you were before. And the reason for the decrease in potential is that the uh, electrons are now being emitted from the surface itself. If you keep increasing the knob on the amount of emission you can get, you can get an SCL sheath. And given collisions in enough time, the potential minimum here in the green line, otherwise known as the virtual cathode, can accumulate positive charges and form an inverse sheath. The, oh, I've lost my cursor, the blue line here. So what's the difference between these different uh, sheaths? So um, first you have the floating case. What we considered on this plot to the left is that the surface is allowed to take whatever potential is required of it in order to maintain a net uh, current of zero and the steady state. And um, the surface electron emission is present in these latter three. So Grant, I wonder if you could, um... Just back up one one second and kind of give a a, a very brief description of the, the physical um, situation that that's being simulated here. Of course. Um, so we consider a one dimensional code. Um, so it's one d one v. So we have one velocity dimension because it's electrostatic. That's all we need. Um, the uh, there's a wall located at x equals zero. 
Um, and far away at about 100 to 200 um, x over lambda to by, we have a symmetry plane. Um, and this wall is allowed to take whatever potential relative to the plasma um, that it wants to. OK, so this so is like a confinement. This is a confinement wall for yes. the burning plasma. Um, not necessarily for a burning plasma. Here we're considering mostly low temperature plasmas. And for the right. rest of this talk, this will be primarily low temperature um, ion electron uh, plasmas, assuming a uniform background. OK, okay thanks. I'll go into more detail about the simulation details. I'm just trying to give a, a brief introduction to the different types of first. OK, thanks. Thank you. Hi, Gustav. Um, for the uh, different types of uh, sheaths, you end up with different uh, charge structures near the surface. And the classical light sheath uh, corresponding to this plot is the density n over n plasma versus the distance from wall. So it's the same as the potential. You end up getting charge separation and a net positive layer uh, near the surface. The electrons are suppressed by the red potential because this is a classical potential, while the ions are accelerated into the wall. And the SCL sheath, the acceleration is not as great. Uh, although the ion profile looks very similar, you end up getting an electron uh, growth near the surface. And this is because you have electrons being emitted from it. Um, now, the real difference is once you start having uh, emitted electrons, or like you start having emitted electrons in the SEL case, but once you allow time for collisions to accumulate ions, positive charges in this uh, SEL potential well, you can accumulate a significant growth of them near the surface. Um, and these ions end up collapsing this negative charge uh, region and you're ending, or positive charge region, sorry, from about X of one to X of about 7.5. You're just left with a negative charge very close to the wall. Um, this is truncated in the density because if not, this uh, density of electrons can be huge compared to the um, plasma density in order to achieve um, an inverse sheath. But typically, your uh, density is rather uh, low compared to this. And you're, the reason you need this is because you have a, such a large separation in your emitted electron temperature over your plasma electron temperature. All right, so where was this first seen? Um, so this is discovery part one, the experiments. Uh, originally, if you have a, a glow discharge, so this is results from Greiner et al. It's PRL in 1993. Um, the cathode sheath, which is located at x equals zero here between um, an electrode and anode, or sorry, a cathode located at x equals zero and an anode located at x of 150 millimeters, um, you end up with most of the potentials uh, taken over the uh, cathode sheath. So if you had anything in this region, it would get accelerated for electrons out towards the um, other boundary or ions, it would be absorbed into the surface. Now, if you end up with a significant amount of surface emission, which is the difference between this panel A and panel B potential versus position plots, um, Brinder noticed that you could end up forming a plasma potential that's at the cathode or near the cathode uh, potential. So trying to explain this, um, he followed it up with simulations. Um, so these simulations show the potential structure uh, versus the plasma potential with the cathode potential marked with this dotted line. Um, you notice there's a small potential drop in the plasma uh, potential everywhere is below the wall potential. And you then have a rise on your anode sheet. So electrons are being um, uh, emitted from the left surface. They uh, diffuse through this middle region and then they're accelerated out to the right surface. And this acceleration is enough to excite neutrals and you end up getting a glow in that region, which is why they call it the um, anode glow mode, typically when you have this. Um, an, another way to look at this is to look at the density plots. And you can see you end up with an electron-rich region near the surface um, and an ion-poor uh, region. And you have ions confined primarily to this bulk um, potential, uh, flat potential region. So another way to look at this, and we'll look at this uh, quite frequently in a phase space picture of the velocity as a function of x over, um, here they normalize it to 10 to 6 meters. But anything with positive of velocity for the electrons are moving to the right, and negative is moving to the left. While the ions, you can see, are trapped um, in their region of phase space, and they can't make it to either boundary here. So this was a 1D pick simulation by Greiner followed two years after he did his initial experiments to explain what he observed. Um, and another person came along, Michael Campanell, um, who started to look at what if you had two surfaces that have um, strong emission 
Here he's looking at secondary electron emission from each surface. And notice that you can actually force the plasma everywhere to be below the potential of um, the surfaces. So this is a, a, also a 1D uh, PIC code. But now, instead of having a power between the two, you end up uh, saying they're both at you know, the same initial position, or same initial um, uh, potential. And then you allow the sheath to charge them from there. Um, and they can remain at the same charge, and they can bring down the entire plasma potential sheath by restructuring the charge layers. All right, so an overview of what we just talked about. An inverse sheath can form when you have a gamma, which is what we'll be using quite a bit, of greater than or equal to about one. And gamma here is defined as the outgoing emitted electron flux over the incoming plasma electron flux in the simulation. Um, the plasma potential and the inverse sheath can be below the wall potential. Um, it can be below both the cathode, like in the bias case and in the floating case. Um, you end up getting a positively charged surface. There is no net current in the steady state um, to the wall for the floating, but there is in the bias case. And then what we'll show in a minute is that you can get a cooling of the electrons up to the surface. Excellent. So the, what's the 1D code? Uh, the 1D code is a 1D, 1V uh, kinetic continuum electrostatic code. We consider two species, ions and electrons, with a uniform background. And we include BGK collisions for the bare minimum to form an inverse sheath, but we've also included other types of collisions in the past, such as Coulomb and ionization, which are particularly important for things like the anode glow mode. Um, we also include surface electron emission in this code, and we, it's written in serial IDL. Um, and we use an Euler step in time and space and various initial boundary conditions. So this is the first step um, in the simulation uh, story. We started with a 1D code, and eventually we are going to go to a 2D code. But to really understand what we're doing and why we did things in the 2D code uh, the way we did, we need to start with, well, what's happening in this 1D system? Um, so I'm going to go through those results first. So what we're solving to um, actually evolves the equation is um, the Boltzmann equation. So we have our velocity space advection. We have our um, no B field in this. We have spatial advection of particles to move in space. And then we have charge um, uh, source terms, which are created uniformly throughout our volume here and 1D and then later in 2D. And then we have our collisions, which can be any of the ones I just described. And this is coupled with a Poisson equation, um, which allows us to get our potential. So results of 1D simulations, this is our part one. Uh, the first question Mike and Maxime were asking is, are two equilibrium uh, states possible? Um, when do you get an SCL versus when do you get an inverse sheath? Um, so what we're looking at here are the phase diagrams from the kinetic continuum code. The first column, um, we're looking at no collisions in the sheath region. When you have a classical sheath formed here, um, so the same plots of potential density we've seen before, but now we're looking at the phase profiles. So you have exponential decay of the density of electrons towards the surface, and you have acceleration of ions towards the surface. So if everyone can bear with a quick doodle, you can imagine an electron coming in and then being reflected uh, away, or you can imagine an ion being accelerated and gaining energy towards the surface. So these two arrows here kind of depict what's going on. Um, in the second case, you have an SCL sheath. You have no collision still in the sheath region, and you have an electron beam, which is this red, uh, higher density of electrons coming off the surface and being accelerated by the sheath potential. Uh, while the ions are now not gaining as much energy as they were before, um, but we're not seeing this transition to inverse. Now, the critical distinction here is once we start inc including collisions and we allow for enough time to pass by that the collisions can accumulate charge and invert uh, the sheath, this is approximately equal to the amount of charge disturbance that you have before. It needs to be neutralized by the accumulated charge. Um, and we use that in a minute to describe a about how long this transition will take. And that's important if you have other loss sources. You need to make sure you're dominating the transition by um, having enough collisions and accumulating enough charge in time. If not, you'll end up looking like a potential SCL sheath. So the, the answer is you can get both depending on the uh, processes going on. Without collisions, 
Um, in a planar geometry, you end up getting SCL. And then with collisions, you end up getting an inverse as long as you're able to hit this critical gamma greater than or equal to about one. All right. Oh, well, let me continue. There we go. So another result of the 1D uh, simulations are from Mike Campanella and his uh, 2018 PRE. You have the cathode and anode uh, set to a fixed bias between them. And you end up getting the same results that Greiner noticed in his uh, particle and cell and his experimental simulations. So we verify that you still get uh, an inverse-like sheath near the surface and a potential minimum um, in our simulations. You have electron traje trajectories like I just traced out. Um, a lot of them, though, are suppressed by the small potential drop. Um, and once they, if the ones that are hot enough and are able to get out of this potential drop uh, stream across this uh, neutral region, um, which is where you have equal ions to electrons, and then they enter the anode sheath and are accelerated out into the anode plate, which is located at the uh, right-hand side of these plots. So looking at density, um, we agree with the same uh, density profiles that they get. And then for finite ion temperature effects, you can end up introducing gradients um, caused by your, uh, you have a now dis, a different uh, density caused by finite ion temperature. Um, so these need to offset each other to have about uh, equal plasma pressure at all points. So you form a gradient um, in this LP region here. So there was a number of modifications that were looked at um, and this uh, gradient will come back in later 2D simulations. So. This is about the time uh, that information, everything we've seen before was known once I joined the team um, at Livermore. And one of the things that we started with for the 1D simulations um, was looking at what happens to the electron temperature near the surface. So what I have here is electron temperature plots versus their distance. Um, so electron, you have a heating region for electrons upstream. And you're asking what happens for the different types of sheaths. So classical-like for blue and purple, and you start emitting more electrons until you get to an SCL-like for green, and then eventually an inverse-like for the pink. Uh, so in this case, we show that you can end up getting um, lower temperature until eventually it's lowered in the inverse sheath to match the target temperature, the T emit um, at the boundary. So this could be an important consequence uh, to achieve diverter detachment um, and has potential applications in that area. And that's something that uh, Mike Campanell, uh, Alex Frieden, and Dave Grote are looking at with warp and warp X is what happens in more tokamak relevant configurations when you have like an oblique B field. Um, as well, this cooling and potentially um, reducing the ion bombardment by having a plasma potential uh, that's lower than the surface potential and no longer accelerates ions into the surface could extend the lifetime of devices like hot cathodes. All right, so the question then became, well, are 2D effects important and for what systems do they become important for? Um, we, uh, from first principles, derived a T transition, so about how long we expect the SCL sheath to take to collapse to the inverse sheath. Um, given a certain amount uh, or certain um, parameters of our system. So starting from like a, a SCL sheath and you have ion accumulation, about how long will it take from first principles? This was written up in a PRE in 2019 by uh, Mike and me. And then, well, what happens if these particles can leak out? So this is a figure uh, from Brian Krauss and Yevgeny Reitz's uh, paper from 2018 about um, uh, strongly emitting filament that potentially could form an inverse sheath, although it's, um, they explain the uh, not total formation of inverse sheaths and more of an SCL-like sheath by diffusion to the surface. So these questions are definitely important. Um, what role does this 2D surface play versus a, um, a planar geometry? So we wanted to write a new code to address this. Um, the new simulation code is 2D2V. Um, it's content, meta continuum and based on the same model for the 1D, 1V. So the blue is the highlighted changes. Originally, this was written in IDL um, to sort of test the concept and make sure everything's working okay. And then it was extended to a hybrid open MP, MPI code in C. So this is where um, NERSC started playing a significant role in um, how to actually run these simulations. They quickly became too large for my desktop to run. Um, considering you have to resolve hundreds of divide lengths and um, also have quite a bit of space in the velocity uh, direction resolved. So 
what the, the main thing that we can do with this now is include multiple types of boundaries. Um, and we're still solving the same Boltzmann Poisson system of equations to the right. So for the new simulation code, one way to look at it, we have Cartesian grids here. So case A, we're looking at a small uh, conducting surface set to some uh, potential V bias. We have a large outer absorbing boundary for the plasma. Uh, so any plasma that hits there is lost. And the way the plasma is reintroduced is with this uh, volumetric source term. And then you have um, a potential V equals zero uh, set to this outer boundary, as well as uh, symmetric planes um, to essentially extend our domain for less cost. Another way that we did this is we had an isolating surface um, surrounded by conducting boundaries out at the edges. And then we solved um, Poisson's equation within all these boundaries to find our um, uh, the potential and be able to evolve our plasma. All right, so how did this hybrid scheme come into play? Um, so one thing that we have is the Poisson solve. I wrote this myself. Um, the reason I really wanted to write this 2D code myself was to get a better understanding and not just have uh, a black box of I put in plasma parameters and I get out results. I, I really have been interested in how to write simulations um, and what's required to build them. And the most challenging component for me was writing an efficient hybrid uh, scheme to solve Poisson's equation. So here I use multiple Fourier analysis. The results aren't efficient, or, or not efficient, sorry, aren't important. Um, but what, how we um, parallelize the scheme is, so each of the um, eigenmodes are calculated on different CPUs. Um, so each CPU is connected to one shared memory on a single node. Um, and then we can sum these all together to find the potential surface. Um, and another way to uh, do this is to also break up our memory. We're having issues where, you know, we upgrade from, you know, one desktop to nurse, and we have a lot more memory, but we still run out of memory. So we need a distributed memory model and we connect all our nodes with MPI and then have on each node um, uh, open MP, pushing our particles and solving the Poisson equation. So MPI is used to hand off all the boundary conditions um, and the fluxes at each of the boundaries while the um, uh, each of the nodes do the heavy lifting on uh, CPUs with uniform memory access. So one of the uh, results that we have um, for 2D, so, so I'm not going to go through all the results because there's quite a few. What we did to verify our 2D code is um, reproducing what we expect, our 1D results. We went through the cases that we saw, such as floating surfaces, um, bias surfaces. And we saw that we were able to do things like reproduce the 2D anode glow mode that we saw in 1D um, and showed that there are emitting surfaces that can still have ion trapping. This has all been summarized in a paper, but I'm going to go on to the new results that the 2D code has um, introduced to, or allowed us to look into. So this is the results just to get a bearing first of how we extended uh, the anode glow mode from a 1D case into a 2D case. I'm going to go through this kind of slowly just to understand what these all these plots are. So we have the distance from the center in Y. We have the distance from the center in X. We still have our absorbing boundaries. This is our case two configuration with a beige electrode located um, near this bottom left corner. So this is the ion density um, plotted as the maximum of the density to zero. So the higher or the darker the color, the higher the density. Well, for electrons, you'll end up um, with a similar plot. Um, but now we've cut off just a, a slight region near the surface because we have so much surface emission, you end up um, overwhelming your contour plot if you don't cut it off at some point. So these two plots are showing the true 2D uh, nature here. And we take slices at y equals 0 for plots C, D, E, and F of the potential, the density, and the phase space. So the potential profile and the ion phase space and electron phase space look very familiar. But the difference is the density. Um, and this is caused by geometric effects. You still have the pressure balance in this case. Um, and that's causing this uh, decay one over R like decay of the density moving away. And you still form this quasi neutral region, although it doesn't look quite the same. And you still have an inverse sheath forming along the inner electrode. And on, along the outer electrode, you have this anode sheath that takes up most of the plasma potential. So another way uh, to look at this, we have um, 2D uh, current enhancement. So 
in planar geometry, uh, the SCL sheath and the inverse sheath, when you have um, a bias between the plates, end up having the same potential um, or same current that's emitted. So this SCL electron current density limit is shared in planar geometry. So what we're plotting here is the current density versus the uh, simulation time. And the valve that we're controlling on this is the amount of emitted electron flux over time. So we keep notching it up to see, all right, well, in 2D, if it behaves like 1D, you would expect this green line and then our blue line for the um, net electron current density to be identical. But that is not the case. <laughs> um, once you form an SCL sheath, which you do about this number two, um, and you ramp up the electron emission again, you, can, uh, you form a virtual cathode, but now you're accumulating charge in the virtual cathode. Um, this charge can't restructure the plasma everywhere to be below the plasma potential like it does in 1D. So its only other option here is to reduce the um, potential of the inverse sheath and collapse the uh, small amount of potential you get there and allow out more electrons from the surface. Eventually, you end up saturating this effect because you don't have enough ions, which is what happens when we keep raising the surface emission to gamma of 10 and gamma of 15. Um, your ions don't play much of a role, so it's really a balance between your electrons and the amount of charge you can accumulate in the sheath. So this is used to understand the next plot. So this current enhancement over the space charge limited sheath um, will give us a hint at what's going on when we compare IV probe traces. So the current density here, um, as far as our um, uh, plot, is going to be uh, given by the current density at the uh, cathode, uh, cathode surface in total. And we have it plotted against V probe minus V plasma. The reason we have the difference is we have a finite uh, domain size here. So the best way to see what a uh, plasma, like a very large plasma with a very small probe would look like is to actually take the difference between these two. Um, and what we end up seeing is that in the classical lake sheath, we get our standard um, IV probe trace. You have a, a ion saturation limit and the, um, when you have a strong negative potential and you have an electron saturation limit in your positive uh, region of uh, V probe over the plasma potential. However, in the other case, now that you have emission, so black is no emission, red, you end up with a gamma of 10. In the first region between about minus 45 volts and about minus 25 volts, you still form a classical like sheath. Uh, your potential is too great and you still take up your, most of your potential drop um, over the cathode sheath. So all of the electrons that are emitted are able to get out. And that's why you have this huge discrepancy in the current density between your uh, not emitting probe and your emitting probe. Once you start sweeping that upwards and you have collisions, um, something new occurs uh, that was not seen before, is that you're able to keep this current density um, near the full um, electron emitted current. Um, the reason for this is that ions accumulate again in the virtual cathode and you get the current enhancement mechanism occurring. Um, of course, this isn't 100% of the current. You no longer have um, as much potential difference to accelerate your electrons. But once you get to about the plasma potential, so V probe is about the potential V plasma, you end up with a very steep new region of your IV trace. Um, and you end up uh, going into your electron saturation here. So where the plasma potential is, um, where your probe is equal to your plasma potential, can be uh, located at the intercepts tier. And the difference between prior uh, studies and this study is that you end up getting about 10 more volts of potential difference um, between your not emitting and your emitting case. So this is a significant difference if you're trying to carefully measure your plasma with an emissive probe. Um, this will be some an effect that you have to be aware of if you have a very, very, very low density plasma. So the virtual cathode um, itself is located with VC, and this is when the potential well starts forming. So that's what the VC forming is here. Another way to look at this um, and see the VC formation as well as the classical sheath is to look at profiles of the potential. So this is again at y equals zero. We're taking um, from our electrode to our anode at the right, our potential profile. And we're seeing that as we reduce the potential, you can start forming this virtual cathode. 
ions are accumulating and allowing out more current, which explains our um, steeper, our, our ion current density being uh, more negative. And eventually you end up forming an inverse sheath near this emitting surface uh, once you have a high enough bias. This inverse sheath uh, potential will keep uh, growing relative to the plasma potential to suppress farther emission. And that's why you end up getting this uh, short tail on the electron saturation part of the probe uh, sweep. All right, the final part that we have is hysteresis. So how would we determine if we had an emissive probe in a plasma, um, what the sheath is around the probe and how would we determine exactly, um, you know, what parameters we have, what type of sheath in uh, around the probe. So one way to potentially do this um, is to pulse the probe's uh, potential. So if you start at minus 30 volts uh, with the same configuration that we were showing before, so this is a uh, probe potential versus time, and you pulse it up to 20 volts, you're now pulsing between a classical-like sheath and an inverse sheath. If you pulse back, um, you've now formed this inverse sheath and you've restructured ions and everything near the surface, you're going to expect a hysteresis as well as different uh, currents during different times of uh, your pulse. So one way to look at this is the current density versus the probe potential. Um, as you start out at large negative biases, you allow out all your current density. Um, and then once you pulse uh, the probe to an inverse sheath, you suppress most of that. If you're around the potential of the plasma, you'll be uh, about zero um, volts. So this is your condition uh, for your floating case. You end up with uh, zero current. So you can imagine how that would occur. If you went too high above your plasma potential, you end up with the opposite occurring and your probes um, absorbing your uh, plasma electrons. Um, in that case, you end up with a very negative current density. Another way to look at this is the current density versus time. So if we focus on just around the pulse region, you end up with your strong current density, and then you uh, pulse it to near the plasma potential, and you're able to see um, the uh, flat top here from about being in the floating condition. So the little transients that you get are electron time scale effects. And if you consider pulsing between, uh, say, a classical sheath and an STL sheath, you'd end up getting ion trapping effects on ion time scales. So what we end up getting from this is that you can uh, pulse to different sheath regimes. And I have more slides if people are interested in the um, backup slide portion um, for looking at pulsing between different uh, sheaths. But you're able to determine where the floating potential is, as well as where the um, uh, sheath around the probe is inverted, SCL, or uh, classical-like. Oh, sorry. And uh, one other way to look at this, sorry, is uh, to end up cycling through 1 to 4. So you can see what I traced out before is cycling from 0.1 to 0.2 to 3 to 4. Um, and it's the same thing as far as the current density. So the future experiments and directions that we hope to take this in, I couldn't help but throw in future directions for the theory too, apologize. Um, so the, uh, the thing that Alex Friedman, uh, Mike Campanella, and Dave Grote are looking at are warp and 1D3V with oblique B fields grazing the surface. Uh, so this can alter your surface emission and your sheath formation. You get more of a Chaldera sheath and a classical like sense. Um, but if you start emitting, uh, then there's a lot of unknown questions, so specifically what would happen. Um, dielectric surfaces are something that are interesting to extend the 2D, 2V code. And there's currently not a, a adequate understanding of what a self-spike instability that we see. I haven't really presented that here, but uh, you can end up exciting uh, modes that are not identified at the moment, but um, hopefully can be described in the future. So. The experiments that uh, are currently in the works um, are at UCLA looking at the large uh, plasma device and electron cooling. And then there's a PPPL emissive probe experiment um, with uh, Yevgeny Rates and um, Mike Campanel. So this is um, the end of my presentation. A special thanks to everyone at NERSC and Mike Campanel for being my mentor at Livermore. I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen. Um, are there any questions that I could answer? I see someone in the chat. Um, thank you. Uh, so the Fourier transform in the 2D code um, is not an FFT, um, is it the, um, uh, or not an FFT algorithm. So I did, I did the calculation myself to come up with a potential for that. 
Thank you, Bruce, for the question. Um, but usually, we only use that for a limited amount of time. We ended up going, I wrote a different code for successive over relaxation to find the potential in um, the odd geometry cases that we became more interested in. So now you can have arbitrary boundaries located pretty much anywhere in your plasma um, with a new solver. The hope is eventually to couple the code to something uh, like a, a linear algebra solver pack, a hyper. Um, and that, that's kind of a future direction for this the 2D, 2B kinetic continuum code. Yeah, thanks, Grant. Grant, if anybody has questions, raise your hand or type them into chat. Um, I have a, a, a bunch of questions. I'm, I'm sure I won't get through them all, but you know, I'm not really an expert in this field, um, of course. But on, on your simulations, um, they're, they're time dependent simulations, but do you, um, do you reach a steady state eventually, or is this a situation, a dynamic situation that the conditions are always changing in some way? And then what, uh, what was the kind of initial configuration, the initial state you started from? Those are all excellent questions. Um, so let me go back just a little bit and um, exit out of the presentation mode here. Um, what's the right slide to show this on? Hmm. All right, I'm going to stick with this slide and then uh, I'll move around as need be. So we start with initial um, Maxwellian case everywhere. Um, so we start with a Maxwellian distribution and allow that to evolve to a steady state. Um, and then later we'd introduce emission in some cases. In some cases, we'd start with emission. It's a large range of different things, but typically we'd want to evolve either to a case where we had no emission, we'd get classical like sheaths on all surfaces. Um, or we would want to move to a, a case where we started with a mission. Let me go forward one slide um, along like a small segment of surface. So these V biased uh, parts are actually emitting um, and allowed to come to a steady state most of the time. Uh, there are cases like the anode glow mode, which has uh, transitory behavior. Um, the self spikes are also an instability, which can uh, affect the sheath. But uh, when I say steady state, uh, typically it's, it, it can actually be the, the steady state and not a transitory state. Okay, I see there's another question, but let me ask you one other thing about um, how did you, was this your, your first attempt to, to code things in OpenMP and MPI? Uh, <laughs> Yes, um, so we, we can go back a slide. I, when I came to Livermore, um, I had one introduction to coding in um, MATLAB, and that was it. <laughs> this was my sophomore year. Um, I thank my camp at L4, not holding that against me. And uh, I, I came in and I learned C and OpenMPI through um, both, uh, and IDL through uh, my camp at L, Maxime, Umansky um, and Blaze Barney also held for an introduction to OpenMP and MPI uh, workshop at Livermore. And that was very instructive. Um, and C was learned from a uh, book, which I have somewhere on a shelf next to me. But yes, yeah, so it was my first time. I'd never used um, uh, uh, even a Mac or a Unix before high performance computing. So it was a lot of on the job training <laughs> to kind of catch up to speed on that. But I was lucky. There's a lot of documentation on how to. Do yeah, that. excellent. Well, that that was a that was a lot to learn. Then that was, that's great that you did that. Did you? Um, how did you think the code performed? Did you? Um, did it run as, as quickly as you would have expected based on your kind of serial experiences? Um, and, and did you ever look at any kind of performance metrics? Um, we, we did look at uh, some very basic performance metrics as far as like particles pushed per second per node. Um, the number was about uh, 8 billion particles per node pushed per second. Um, but you know, benchmarking that to other things hasn't really been done, so it's hard to kind of you know, give a fiduciary of where that's at compared to other codes. But compared to our serial code, um, if we gave it, say, eight nodes versus a serial code, it's, it's, hard, it's difficult to compare in that case because you have a lot more memory. We didn't really compare the same memory on one to another. Um, but we were getting very good scaling in the Poisson solver. That was our typical bottleneck that we had. 
Um, and the next was the um, uh, charge advection. Um, and I see a question from Alex Friedman that I'm going to kind of weave in here, um, was that the particles were pushed with the Euler step and we did do upwind uh, particle pushing um, in this case. So we weren't as interested in the instabilities, but we're more interested in preserving the monotonicity of the solution um, as well as um, uh, more of the steady state configuration that we get. Uh, so we hit it with resolution. Great. So I think uh, you can see the, the chat questions and you, I'll, I'll let you field the, the ones you want to. Okay. Um, so Bruce, you asked one more thing. Did the 2D kinetic continuum code have any tendency uh, to filmation of the distribution functions in velocity space? Um, do I have any good examples of that? Um, so the, the main reason we ended up doing a kinetic continuum code uh, was because you ended up with an ion cloud that couldn't be described very well with fluid uh, codes that end up, hold on, sorry, let me, let me find a good picture here. Okay, um, this isn't what I wanted. And I know it's hidden somewhere in my backup slides if I'm gonna start here. So for the ion distribution space, um, you end up getting a, a acceleration collision fly help against. Okay, um, definitely. Uh, Bruce follows it up with collisions would probably help against numerical filamentation. Um, what we end up seeing, the reason we end up using like a can I continuum code over like a fluid code um, was the um, ion space. You end up with a large trapped cloud of cold ions. So you could imagine. I'm going to do some annotation, which is always dangerous. So bear with me, everyone. Um, you have your typical SCL-like uh, configuration, which is this ion distribution that's accelerated towards the wall. But you can end up forming a large cloud of um, non-thermal ions near the surface, uh, which motivated our choice to use this kind of scheme, um, was to resolve these kinetic effects specifically, as well as introduce our volume uh, effects. I guess, do you have any uh, specific um, numeric filamentation? I guess, um, uh, are you meaning like aliasing, Bruce, or? Bruce may be muted. Well, do you want Bruce? me to talk? Yes, yes. go ahead. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, collisionless flash off codes, you know, continuum codes. Um, are pretty notorious for filamenting um, as time goes on. Um, like I said, collisions mitigate that. Um, you know, it's, yeah. the, it's the lore, it's in, embedded in the literature and continuum kinetic codes that that happens. But um, so, if your code was going to have problems in that respect, it would have it would have surfaced, and uh, you you would have stopped you in your tracks, and you'd have to have done something. So I take the answer is no. You didn't have it, such trouble. I, I would agree with your answer. Looks <laughs> like <laughs> we have a hand up, uh, Igor. Oh. Go ahead, Igor. Yeah, I can't. Uh, Igor. Very good uh, results, impressive. Uh, I, I have a question to you. Uh, when we looked at with the uh, particle and cell codes, we <laughs> saw a lot of oscillations, right? Uh, I don't know if you saw, right? Mike's, uh, another physical letter was on explaining oscillations when distribution functions, right, changes, and that changes potential and kind of self coupled into oscillations. That may require some kind of at least heating in the system. And I'm just curious if you plan to do that or saw something similar in your code. To make sure I'm uh, talking about the same thing, these are the um, the hull thruster simulations where you had uh, B field as well. Right, right. Um, so in in this case, um, we we didn't see uh, ex, uh, uh, excited oscillations beyond these cell spike or two stream instabilities when you had uh, the strong beam. Um, entering the plasma. Uh, these are all considered um, in electrostatic cases here. Um, so we, we don't end up 
with um, any electromagnetic effects. Um, so the, the short answer is that no, no, we did not see uh, the same uh, excited modes, I believe, as what we're seeing in those cases. No, that was also electrostatic, right? That was relatively simple physics. What you know surprised me when we were trying to kind of uncover these oscillations that there was a coupling between distribution function and the shears. And so that coupling um, kind of produced this new kind of oscillations. It, it, it may maybe not your case because we, we did have a different situation with second electron emission. But yeah, that, that, I think to me that was the most interesting effect which we saw and was a fuzz explanation. Great. Um, yeah, Alex. So uh, in, in the particle code, we see long lasting oscillations. And I, I wonder, typically continuum codes can be diffusive and smear out things and maybe do some damping of oscillations. And you may be seeing some of that uh, and that may explain some of the difference. Also, Mike privately answered the question I posed. The, the performance criterion was sort of number of cells pushed, not number of particles pushed. Okay, that's, yes, correct. Interesting. Yeah, that was, that was one question I, I did have also, Grant, was I wondered if you had um, re compared these results to uh, a similar situation using different codes or different uh, methods of solution? So um, mostly our comparison um, has been uh, not, not confined beyond the qualitative components of looking at like these original simulations for PIC um, uh, from these two papers. That's where most of our comparisons have been. We, we did a comparison against the 1D code with, between PIC and the comparison was really excellent. Mm, okay. That happened after I, I departed. <laughs> that was after your watch, yeah. Uh, Grant, as you know, we have 2D and 3D codes if you <laughs> feel like comparing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so, um, I, I believe most of the physics, if not all the physics, with just slight modifications could be done in LSP. So that'd be a very interesting thing to see how they compare between 2D um, results in LSP versus uh, our kinetic, like 2D code or LTP pick, of course. I, I'm talking about ATP. I don't know if you oh. noticed. Yeah, it, it, it has um, slightly more diagnostics and better parallelization. Mm -hmm. LSP. Okay, Tony, was that your hand from previously? Uh, no, I want to ask the question. Okay. Hi, Tony. Hey, great, great talk. Uh, I want to ask about some of the phenomenology on slide 19. All right, me. All right. So uh, I'm curious what happens at this peak between three and four, where you say the transition to AGM ion cloud dissipates. Can you define AGM mm -hmm. and say more about what's happening there? Yes. So the AGM, um, I believe I didn't say it in its abbreviated form, is the anode glow mode. Um, so if I go back a few slides, um, so this is the 2D anode glow mode. Um, you could imagine the AGM without any ions present. So if you just had electrons being emitted from the surface, what would this profile look like? Um, you would end up getting a um, current limited uh, sheath um, that would end up being uh, limited by just the electrons. It looks something like this. The ions end up filling, if you can see the doodle hopefully, on the plot C for the potential. So without ions, you end up with um, a potential minimum and uh, current density limited sheath. Um, once you have ions, you end up collapsing this because the ions can spread out in this potential well. Um, so what's happening in this next plot is that you have, um, Oh, let me go, sorry, forward. You end up uh, getting to the point that any farther increases in your electrons that are emitted just force the potential down farther into this uh, truly charge limited regime. The ions can no longer neutralize um, increases in the uh, emitted electrons from the surface. 
Sissy, thanks for that description. And can you connect it to the traces on the next plot? In the next slide, you've got these three. Yes. Uh, um, maybe after so, that, the one where you go, yes, this one. Excellent. Um, so yes, well, what you end up getting is, what I just described is a process that's a limit, uh, limiting the amount of net current density that you can get in case three, or like 0.3 here. Um, your potential, if you increase the potential of this probe here relative to the outer sheath by say another factor of two, you would find that um, the plasma potential would be dragged pretty closely with the um, surface potential and it would increase slightly between the surface potential, uh, I keep losing my cursor here, sorry about this, um, between your surface potential and your plasma potential. Um, so that would be to suppress any farther electron emission from the surface. Um, while also uh, limiting the amount of um, uh, emission that you can end up having. So it, it'll look eventually like a straight line between the two. Um, this sheath will expand to be the whole, you know, pretty much kind of the whole distance between the two plates. And you'll be suppressing all of the current trying to get out from the surface. Thanks, that answers my question. Thank you for the question, Tony. So um, let me ask you a question about, so the surface is, um, is there, are there assumptions in what the, the, the characteristics or the material of the surface is, and does, it, does that make any difference? So we consider a, a simple surface. Um, the surface is usually, or is, it's always conducting, um, but we don't consider the specific work function or anything of the surface. We consider that you have some emitted distribution of electrons, which is um, you know, half Maxwellian moving away from the surface. Um, and these can vary in temperature, but typically uh, a value we'll use is about 0.2 electron volts. So the width of the inverse sheath ends up uh, being dictated by the temperature of the emitted electrons, because that's the length of the by shielding is going to occur on. Um, and that's your primary uh, temperature that you'll end up cooling to. Um, when we consider the 1D cooling configuration. Cool. Any other questions? We're about out of time. Um, if not, Grant, I want to congratulate you and thank you again um, for this talk. And thank everyone for listening to your great questions. And thank you, Richard, for hosting. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. All right, have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Grant.